Today, we are launching a new series at Yahoo Finance, Lead This Way, where we talk with some of the titans of industry about their biggest challenges and how they are leading through them. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi recently met up with Abercrombie and Fitzio, Fran Horowitz in New York City. All right, over the past six years, Fran Horowitz has rebuilt a mall apparel icon in Abercrombie and Fitch that fell on hard times under prior leadership. She shared with me her turnaround playbook and how she leads with authenticity inside a newly opened Abercrombie and Fitch store in New York City. This is Fifth Avenue, the mecca of retail, and here's Abercrombie and Fitch back in New York City. Probably the proudest moment of my career. No one said it could be done. So how do you become a successful turnaround CEO? You lead with compassion, you lead with hustle, you lead with empathy. You take all those terms together and you get Abercrombie & Fitch CEO, Fran Harwitz. Going back to those early days working in a retail store in high school, are there lessons you learned back then that set you up to do things like this? The biggest um, impression in my career was at Bloomingdale's. I worked, Mike Gold was CEO, Frank Doroff was my, was my GMM, and they were the most authentic, people-oriented managers. I, to this day, am fortunate to think that that's really where the best part of my career started because they taught me how to lead. And I lead now through authenticity. What does leading with authenticity mean? It's gonna sound kind of crazy, but it's you have to be you. And perhaps that isn't what a person can give, but I leave it all out there. I mean, I'm just, I'm very approachable. I'm very real. I go to the cafe every day, you know, and make sure I get coffee and chit chat with everybody while they're online. Our meetings are very inclusive of all the levels in the organization. And that's, those are honestly things that I learned um, really early on in my career and have taken with me all the way through. And when we're at work, I admit when I'm wrong. And it's one of the funnest things I do with the team because I'll say, I'll challenge, I'll disagree. And then I'll say, when we come back to the follow-up meeting, I wanna know if I was wrong, tell me I was wrong. And we've gotten to a place where they're very, they, they will tell me, and that's great. And if I'm right, that's okay too well, sometimes. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, it's not, how do you deal with that feedback just, when it's not positive? You have to smile and take it just like as if it was positive. Then you have to say, okay, what was the lesson learned? What didn't I see? How come I didn't see it the way you saw it? What information did you have perhaps that I wasn't thinking about? And then it becomes a really great dialogue between you and the associate because you're really trying to probe and understand perhaps what you didn't see or vice versa, you know, what, what they didn't see. What were your first big moves at the company? When I shopped the mall way back in 2014, and I saw Abercrombie and Hollister, they were essentially the same brand with the same product with a different nameplate and a different price tag. And it was a precarious time. I mean, the brands were not loved. The business was in a downward spiral. You know, we went through a lot of starts and stops, but what we knew through the whole thing was there was an affinity and a love for the brand and consumer insights that kept telling us, keep going, you're gonna get this and you're gonna figure it out. And then pivoting the team and the company from telling the customer what they wanted to hearing what the customer wanted and providing that for them. You walked into our stores and it was about presentation and how the store looked. You don't have to smell it, you know, six blocks down before you, before you get to the store, very candidly. Now it's about what, how's the customer experience? What's important to the consumer? How are we making sure that we're pleasing them every time they shop with us? What is your turnaround playbook? Because driving a turnaround for a brand that has had a lot of ups and downs since its founding, what, 1892? 1892. I and mean, that's, that's not easy stuff. No, it's not. There's a couple of lessons learned. So I, I went through this experience prior at Express. So I would say that turning that brought with me some good, some good lessons. The number one lesson that I brought with me was patience and timing. And to think that you can do it all at once, you're gonna burn out your team and they're just, they're not even gonna be here to do it for you. So that, that, was, that was a big important lesson for me. So I feel like when I got to Abercrombie, I just knew I had to, to pace it differently. I think building the team is also incredibly important because we had a lot of long-term associates, many of whom are still with us, and we have new thinking. 
And bringing those two together is one of my proudest moments that I've built a team that actually has some of the you know, original thinkers as well as some new thinkers and that brought together some incredible, incredible energy. And lastly, make a mistake. And when you make the mistake, just fix it and move on. But if you wait until you think everything is perfect and ready to go, you're never, you're gonna stand still, you're, you're not gonna get anywhere. But I will tell you the company whoop, was at quite an inflection point. And you know, with, between the business, the profitability, and all the things that were <laughs> swirling around, I mean, the first, the first two years were extraordinarily challenging. Fran, looking back, what would you tell your former self? You know, I think what's very important as you go through your career is to learn how to advocate for yourself. And that is, it's not an easy thing to do because you have to balance between being humble and being proud of what you've accomplished. But I would tell you, as I've progressed and built confidence through my career, I've learned more and more that advocating for yourself is a very important thing to do. If you believe that people know what you're doing and what you're succeeding in, you, um, most times not. And so that would be my, my best advice to give to someone, which would be to advocate for yourself. Lastly, I'll put the notes aside, Fran. Okay. What, what do you think will be your legacy in retail or in life? I guess what I would hope for is that my legacy would be um, a leader that people really enjoyed working for. Someone who brought them inspiration, happiness, you know, taught them a lot along the way, had them take away good lessons from all of that. But I think leadership would be my most important thing that would, would make me the happiest. All right, Sazi, so fantastic job as always, my friend. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, let me, effort. Let effort. me ask you, when you talk to Fran Horowitz, mm -hmm. what's your sense of where she's taking this company next? Where is Abercrombie and Fitch headed from here? Well, quick backstory, I've probably known Fran five years, and she really came back uh, and joined Abercrombie really at one of its low points in its history. I mean, there was massive turmoil inside this company at headquarters, in the stores. Nobody was really buying the merchandise. It was completely out of style. So yeah. it has taken time for her to get this point. And even to come to do an interview like this has taken time because she finally has results to back it up. Really three key ingredients I think here underpin this turnaround. One is culture. Fran is, and her team have worked very hard to reset the culture inside the company, whether it's the headquarters or in the stores. One of her first moves when she joined Abercrombie & Fitch was to stop spraying cologne throughout all Abercrombie stores and encourage uh, associates turn back on the lights. Keep in mind, Abercrombie and Fitch, 15 years ago, you walk in, it felt like a dance club. So uh, really resetting the culture started at the store level. Number two, back to retail basics. Uh, you go into these Abercrombie and Fitch stores and Hollister stores, and you're compelled to buy something, even if you're over the age of 25, me included. I have bought something recently at Abercrombie and Fitch. I have not aged out, very important. And I think we saw it in the most recent Abercrombie earning results about two weeks ago. And yeah. then last but not least, this is a company that has leaned into social media. They now have almost, I believe, 100,000 followers on TikTok. They're aggressive on social media, aggressive getting their new message and their new marketing and their new clothing out to next generation shoppers, and the results are starting to prove out. And the stock up 250% in the past yeah, year. Yeah, to your point, it's like, it's to use an overused phrase. It reminds me of that phrase, don't call it a comeback, because I remember when Abercrombie and Fitch was huge, and then they lost their luster, and then now they're staging this comeback. There were several things that stood out to me uh, in that interview that you did with Fran. It was a great interview, by the way, but the owning your mistakes. Um, uh, the, you know, the, you make a mistake and you move on. It's just, you know, it's a great mindset. And then the talk about perfection. And I've heard this phrase before, don't let perfection be the enemy of uh, progress. So what was it that stood out to you about how she leads? Well, I think I was really reminded in doing this. And for me personally, this is the thread that is going to tie all of these interviews for Lead This Way, at least season one, together. There's more underneath the numbers than you know, just numbers and spreadsheets and Google Docs. There are human beings. And these human beings, whether they are a CEO, CFO, CMO, whatever it is, or the people at the store level, in the case of Abercrombie, they're the ones getting it done. And it's the CEO's job to set that tone and lead by example. And I think Fran has done that, whether it's her eating lunch in the cafeteria with employees, whether it's her walking tons of stores uh, every single month, she is very forward-looking, forward-facing. She interacts with employees, and I think that's very key. And she truly believes in what she's trying to do. Now, not to sound Pollyannish, you know, results might slow in next year, who knows? But she has driven a very, very good comeback, and the stock market has finally started to realize that.
right, Executive Editor Brian Sazi, thank, thank you. you so Appreciate much it. for thank launching you. Lead This Way. Thank you. All right, to dive into what it takes to turn around a retail company in this day and age and the state of the retail space, we want to turn now to Storch Advisor CEO Jerry Storch, along with Simeon Siegel, BMO Capital Markets Managing Director and Senior Analyst. Jerry, I want to start with you with this. Fran Horowitz of Abercrombie & Fitch is taking you the credit for turning around uh, the retailer. What is your take, Jerry? Well, I, you know, she just heard it she, from you just heard from her. She explained what she did. The most important thing is that passionate focus on the customer. At the end of the day, that's what every business is about. Big or small, any business is about the customer. So she saw that the merchandise wasn't right for the customer. You know, it, it had been horribly stale and she fixed it. She saw that the two brands that they had, you know, were basically offering the same thing and she differentiated it. I mean, it's still very young. I don't know. I heard some people there didn't age out. I aged out a long time ago from either of them. But you know, some are for teens and some are for, uh, for you know, older teens or young adults. But, uh, but it's very clear who the customer is. And she's passionate about making sure that's what she's offering them. So, and the final thing she did, she brought it, the brands back into the mainstream. They had gotten so, you know, weird, kind of almost edgy, that the market was tiny for what they were selling. And now it's something that everyone in those target segments uh, can be excited about. So she did a, she's a consummate merchant, which is all about details, all about passion. She did a very good job. And I'm sure, I mean, as long as she's there, they're going to keep doing it. And Simeon, I want to bring you in here as well. Listen, you cover the industry, you cover the name. Simeon, nobody knows retail better. How common or how rare is it, Simeon, for a retailer to be able to turn around, to turn itself around the way Horowitz turned around this particular brand? Can you see that I'm blushing from uh, I don't know how the lighting works. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Um, listen, it's not common, but it's not, I mean, it's not not doable. I, I think there's a thought here. It's very hard to kill a retailer. I think that there's a notion that if you can know your customer, Jerry put it perfectly, if you, if you know who it is that you're trying to sell to, then at the end of the day, if you're willing to forego what the identity was in the past, you have the distribution. You have brand awareness. I think you built, you start with a great foundation that even if you have to change and remodel a little bit of the store, you can do that. So is it very common to watch a business go like this? Well, it happens to retail all the time. I think what's really interesting about it right now is it's working through that teen space, which tends to be so fickle. And Jerry, uh, switching gears here a bit, you know, Fran may be the CEO of a multi-billion dollar retail company, Jerry, but you know, what lessons can small business take from her turnaround story and your insights as well as, as a former retail exec yourself? Well, you know, honestly, it's the same. It, it, it doesn't really matter how big the company is. The challenge is similar. And it, it's not easier just because it's smaller either. You know, at the end of the day, it's still starting with the customer. What do they want and how do I give it to them? And, you know, we all talk about how great store environments can be or not be, and there that's important. But really, what does a retailer do? Except the place you go to buy something, once you're once you've left, you've left. So what did you get? Is it what you were looking for? Is it something that was worth more than what you paid? That's what retailers do. And so a good retailer can do that. If you stay focused on it sounds again, we're saying it a third time, stay focused on the customer, then you can succeed. It is a million details, though. It is an enormous amount of energy. And you can see that in Fran, right? You know, in running one of these retailers. And it's what, what that also means, though, it's unusual maybe in business, but uh, one or two great leaders really can do what it takes in terms of lifting it up and building the team that it takes in order to drive the business. You can make a huge amount of difference just by kind of take, I, I used to use the, you know, the metaphor of taking a big syringe full of adrenaline and shoving it into the, uh, you know, into the tail end of an elephant. You really can move it. You know, it's a business in a very short cycle time compared to like, you know, pharmaceutical industry or something like that, where you can make a difference if you have high energy and are focused. So, Jerry, uh, this is a crucial time of year for retailers. And we just got data in that we've looked at with regard to Cyber Monday. And then before that, Black Friday, we saw $9.8 billion in sales on Black Friday, more than $12 billion for Cyber Monday. But what retailers are best positioned as we look ahead during the rest of this holiday season? The first thing I want to say is be careful with those numbers. You can't take the Adobe numbers out of context and project what's going on in retail. Those are only e-commerce numbers. And most of the numbers they've quoted are just totally consistent with the year of growth that e-commerce has had all along because e-commerce is taking share. We're not so sure what's happening in bricks and mortar retailing, but from what I've heard, a lot of what we saw in the you know growth on the internet was at the expense of bricks and mortar. So be careful. It may not be 
you know, that astounding holiday season as people are screaming record numbers on Black Friday, you know, all of that, not so clear. Uh, given that environment, I'm still, I still, you know, you know, think the winners are those that provide tremendous value. Walmart has done great. I think they're performing as well as I've ever seen them perform. Their position in the area the consumer is focused on, which is, you know, closer in necessities, groceries, things like that. They're going to continue to do, to do fantastic. Costco continues to perform at a very high level. TJX, yeah, very high level, you know, excellent company, you know, numbers that are fantastic. And then, of course, Amazon, because that Internet is growing and they are clearly the best on the Internet. Meanwhile, retailer after retailer, the other guys, they're reporting big negative numbers. Sometimes the stock has seen a surge like, uh, you know, we, we've seen that recently with some some companies that uh, showed higher earnings than expected. But this, look at the sales. Best Buy, negative seven. Lowe's, negative seven. Uh, Norsham's, negative seven. Same store sales. Macy's, negative seven. Kohl's, down six. You know, Target, down five. Home Depot, down four. There is a lot of carnage out there on the top line, for sure, in retailers right now, because consumer is not open up their wallet and buying like crazy. And Simeon, when you look at your coverage universe, get you in here too, who are some of the, the winners and losers in retail, you know, looking ahead, Simeon, you know, break it down for us, discounters, luxury, athletic gear, what do you see? Josh, loving you bring me back in. I'm keeping notes on the things that I wanted to catch up on. One, I wanted to point out that retail is all about storytelling. So back to the turnaround story, let's keep in mind the marketing. No, so um, listen, I, I think that Victoria's Secret reported today, they told us that November feels up. Like they told us that Black Friday, the weekend was good. And that obviously is a big store business. So I think that what we do, everything I've been seeing, so I, I generally agree with Jerry that a lot of these numbers we have to take with grains of salt for context, but the people that I'm talking to, what we are seeing, what we're hearing, I think so far, the Black Friday weekend, the holiday has gotten off to a good start. I think the biggest question is gonna be less, did it perform now and more what's gonna happen in the lull? We've got a long time between now Christmas. So I think that's going to be this interesting dynamic of did the strength that starts, does it carry through? And when we think about what Victoria Cooper said, they did guide January and, Feb and December to see a material step down. So that'll be one thing worth watching. Um, but but I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit more, I think, optimistic and flag that most of consumer just reported. And from what I'm looking at, a little over 50% reported revenue growth and the all saw fantastic gross margin. So I think it is a little bit more of a case by case and, and kind of Jerry went through the winners. And so I think when I look through this, I'm seeing a dichotomy, but it's not as much group agnostic. I'm seeing a lot of pairings. I'm seeing companies like Athleta see revenues down and we'll see Lulu up, right? You're seeing companies like Coach up and Michael Kors down. They sell the same thing. And so, and that works with, with the big box as well. And so that works in off price as well. You're watching Nordstrom Rack and Old Navy have revenues down. You're seeing J. Ross Burl be up. So I think right now we're finally in this environment where winners, people who predict their demand well are going to continue to win. And those that don't are going to lose. That's that's an interesting retail opportunity. And so that, that actually makes me a little bit more optimistic. So neither of you named who you really see as potentially losing in this space. I heard some names of winners. We did. I saw the, new, the Victoria's Secret results today. Um, we know that Walmart's been a winner. I haven't heard Target uh, be mentioned as well. Simeon, I want to ask, who do you see as not doing as well uh, in the current retail landscape? So it's interesting because Jerry framed stock versus company. And I think that matters because I think a lot of the business, if we look at the stocks that went up are not necessarily the ones that the revenues went up. So simply even saying, what are the winners? What, who, who's losing? Question becomes, what does it mean to lose? Right? I told you Lulu's going to presumably put up a nice revenue number. Is the stock going to be up? We'll see. The stock's at $430, $435. So I think right now we can see whose revenues are down. And so if that's the simple mitigator, then, then we could just run through those and, and see that Nordstrom Rack did see a decline in revenues, despite the fact that they're in the off price category. But I think it is more complicated than that. I think kind of when we think about what's overvalued, where are the expectations? Some people would say that Victoria's Secret is showing a sign of inflection, but a lot of which is because it was perceived to be negative walking into it. So I guess I would throw the question back at you when you're asking me who's losing. Is it just a question of whose revenues are down? Or are we thinking about, okay, where have this mis where, where's the stock mismatched? Well, we are actually going to have to leave it there because we've run out of time. And I'm not just saying that, okay? So we're going to have to bookmark our conversation. <laughs> no, I promise you. I promise I'm not just saying that. We're going to bookmark our conversation for time. Uh, but it's great to have both of you with us. Jerry Storch, Storch Advisor, CEO, and Simeon Siegel, BMO Capital Markets Managing Director. Thank you both.